Thank you. Uh, welcome you all. It's good to see you all uh, again in this uh, little community of Mind and Life Europe friends and the community of contemplative education. Uh, my name is Gabo Karsai, Managing Director of uh, Mind and Life Europe. And today we have a really special friend and guest here with us, uh, Professor Catherine Ware. I'm sure some of you know her uh, really well, but uh, I would like to introduce her for those who may not know her that well. Uh, Catherine is a longtime friend of Mind and Life Europe and is an association member who has helped to form and shape the community of contemplative education, uh, dear project of Mind and Life Europe. And uh, Catherine is also co-lead for education for the UK Mindfulness Initiative, an internationally respected and influential think tank, which works closely with Mind and Life Europe, including to the work, uh, through the work of its director, Jamie Bristow. Uh, Catherine is known internationally for for her work on well-being, social and emotional learning and mindfulness in education. She has published widely, reviewed the evidence-based base, advised the UK government, EU and WHO, and developed uh, practical strategies in these fields across most European countries. And you might know her recent best-selling book that she co-wrote with Zen master Tichnatan happy teachers change the world. And this book actually has been translated into many languages. So it's a real privilege to have you, Catherine, here with us. And we are really looking forward to hearing about your more recent work uh, paper called Implementing Mindfulness in Schools, an evidence-based guide that is accessible through the Mindfulness Initiatives website. But we will hear today directly from you about this uh, paper and the findings you have. So thank you. welcome and thank you so much. Thank you. Shall I, shall I speak for a minute before I share screen yes. and all is lost? I'll do my best people to manage the technology. Uh, it's yeah, delightful to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's, it's not so much a paper, Gabor, it's actually a kind of book, really. It's about 125 pages. <laughs> with, with quite a lot of uh, white space, but it's uh, quite substantial. Um, and I'll be talking ab about it today and also talking about where we're going next with it, because I think thought that might interest people just as much as going through something that we've already done, because I think our next step is quite interesting. So I shall try and share screen. Hold on to your hats, people. There we go. I think this is it, I think. Yep, how's that going? All right. If I press the um, wrong slide, but uh, let me just get back to the beginning. Excuse me. Right. OK. Can you see a slide that says mindfulness in education? And can you can you all hear everyone hear me, Gabor? Just raise your thumb. Yes. All I, I, can, see now is, all, all I can see now is, is Gabor, which is great. Um, and I will talk for 30 minutes or so, possibly 40 at the most. And I think, Gabor, you're going to be collecting any questions in the chat. And then we're, we're quite a small group, so we should be able to uh, have questions and comments. So what I'm talking about is to look at this guide that, um, that we've written um, and give a glimpse of where we hope we're going next, because I thought that could be quite interesting. So my intentions today are to sketch out the context in which this document was created. I thought that was quite important and share the choices we made when we were writing it so you can understand what it's who it's for and what it's about. Outline obviously its key messages and its emphases that might be of interest I hope to people in lots of fields not certainly not just schools and particularly I think sketch out where it is we're taking all this next because it's been out now for about nine months so obviously we're now um, going in new directions with it building on that work and very much to get any questions thoughts and feedback all this is very much work in progress so I'd really appreciate um, any thoughts you've got about how this work could be better. Now the mindfulness initiative is uh, quite a small think tank um, and I thought you might like to see what it's about if you look at on its website which I'd recommend folks to do there's lots of rich materials there it bridges contemplative practice and public policy championing the inner dimension of social change. 
So I think we can see right from the outset that it's about a lot more than is often meant by mindfulness, particularly in that reduced sense. Um, it's very much a wider vision of what we mean um, by contemplative practice and the inner person and how this links with change in the world. Therefore, maps very well, I think, onto the missions of organisations like Mind and Life Europe and, and others. So it's quite a, a far-sighted little organisation. And in 2015, there was a landmark report published by the, the Mindfulness Initiative, which came out originally, by the way, from working politics. It began with Jamie Bristow, who is the um, director of it now, working for nothing, slogging away for two years to try to influence politics in the UK and running mindfulness courses for politicians on the grounds that you start at the top and you start with those who you want to influence most. So at this point, I think 70 politicians had done a mindfulness, an eight week mindfulness course. And Jamie collected together some of the thinkers in this field, including myself in education, but also in politics, health, the workplace and criminal justice and wrote this landmark um, report, which you might well be interested to have a look at and the findings of, of which are still important. And now he, it's formed into a small think tank. That is the lovely Jamie in the middle, um, in, in larger, uh, the chap in the middle with the glasses. And he is a brilliant guy. He's talked, I know, for Mind and Life Europe, Gabor, about his, um, his building set agency. And around him, we have a sort of little um, photo montage of the faces of all of us who are concerned in education, health, the workplace, race, race, um, the blue light services, interestingly, the, the, um, the emergency services and politics. Chris Ruane there is, the, is leading this in politics. So we, we represent quite a lot of fields, but as you can see, we're quite a small group really. But we have published some quite seminal documents. And again, people might well be interested in these. Sorry, it's a little bit small, but you can go on the website and see them. Top left, we've got the one I'm talking about today, the schools one, but we've also got a field book for innovators, a book about the workplace, a book about anti-racism, COVID, um, about uh, the economy, and Jamie's very seminal work on developing agency in urgent times. And on the right, there's a collection of essays that people have written in response to that. And Jamie's currently working on a, a new piece on, climate, on mindfulness and climate change. So these are quite powerful documents. So this is what the Mindful Nation report said about education in 2015, which we, are, we then built on. Um, at the time, there was clearly promising evidence of outcomes for teachers and for students. The importance of using a whole school approach and embedding mindfulness across the school, not just in the curriculum. How important the quality of implementation is. It's not enough just to have a a project you need to actually implement it well and the absolute centrality of the teachers themselves practicing and um, not just seeing this as something you can buy a book and give to kids or stick it on an app or on the video or a plug and play it, it has to be lived and breathed by the teacher so we knew that in 2015 really um, but we created a consultation because we then got some funding to do more work in education. So the first thing we did was to consult, including by the way of the Rotterdam meeting, which Jamie Bristow came to as well as myself, which was run by Mind and Life Europe. So it built on all of that work really. And what people told us was that we needed some definitive guidance, which needed to be of this particular type, it needed to be based on an authentic view of what mindfulness is, not just any old mindfulness. Um, based on evidence and therefore trustworthy and authoritative. So it needed to be quite a serious document, but it also needed to be written for people who are busy, who work in schools, universities, colleges, and therefore to be practical and grounded and user friendly and appealing. So presented in a way with plenty of bullet points and white space and, and clear logos and so on. But finally, we also felt it needed to be visionary, not just to trog over what's already happening, but to say, where does this need to be going? So inspired by an ethic and a vision as well. So we tried, we've tried to do all of those in this guidance. And just to say it's gone down quite well, the, um, the uh, title page will show you, you know, quotes from people like John Kabat-Zinn and, and the very eminent Gabor, who wrote a nice little one for us. But it's gone down well with people finding it all, I think all the things that we hoped it would be. So it's divided into three. And the first is what is mindfulness, understanding what it is. 
Second bit is, does it work? And if so, how? And I think the how, looking at the neuroscience and psychology is quite new. And then the third part really does bring together new thinking about how do we make this work in schools? So it goes well beyond what, what's usually been brought together. And there's a postscript, which I'll build on at the end about where next. So that's the that's what's in it with a lot of appendices and reference lists and lists of resources and so on. It's pretty comprehensive, really. It took a long time to write, I can tell you. <laughs> So let's start with what mindfulness is. Well, we were very keen not to fall into the traps that many schools and education places do, and to uh, which I'll talk about in a minute under myths and misconceptions, and to try to get across what mindfulness is, which is, I think, as we all know, paying attention to present moment experience inside ourselves and our bodies and in our environment. So it's about being present with what is happening. But this is the attitudinal qualities are vital as well, with an attitude of open mindedness, curiosity, kindness, care. One could add lots of words like compassion and, and non-judgment and so on. So it's not just the being present. Uh, you could be a, a mindful shoplifter if you don't have the attitudinal qualities. So it has an ethic that underpins it, too. And it's about relating to experience in a different way. As I'll say in more detail in a moment, this is not relaxation spelt differently. It's not just about feeling good or feeling calm. It's about relating to all of our experience, including the difficult, including really actually understanding and, um, and being with difficult experience. It's not just an immediate fix it to feel better. And we tackled the quite important question about the religious angle or the spiritual angle, um, which puts some people off, really, and you have to be careful when you're writing a document for the general public to say, well, fundamentally, it's a natural human capacity. Um, it, you know, we, we know very much it was in, it's part of ancient wisdom traditions, but because it makes sense to human beings, this is not something weird and esoteric. This is the ability to that has been as, as old as the hills, really. So we attempted to dispel some of the myths and misconceptions that are prevalent in education, which bedevil mindfulness. One is that it's like this little lad here, just about sitting calmly on your bottom with the sun behind you, going om and feeling, feeling good. It's not just for students. In fact, you start with teachers and it doesn't always result in you feeling good and feeling calm. You may feel even more agitated um, after a mindfulness practice. Obviously, over time, the, the point is to find ways to contact one's, one's inner self and to find ways to, to be fully present and in a calmer way. But it's not an immediate fix it. And people who start mindfulness and then feel uh, let down when they don't immediately feel calmer and more relaxed really haven't been educated in what mindfulness actually is. It's certainly not about emptying the mind. Uh, and again, a lot of people complain after five minutes of meditation. I'm still thinking there's something wrong with me. It's not for me. So it's, it's not about emptying the mind. It's about paying attention and bringing the mind back to what we were in theory focusing on. Um, I think John kabat once said you only need to do it a million times in each 20 minute practice. Uh, it's not about getting people to be conformist and follow the rules and um, put up with any old nonsense. It's not about, uh, you know, it's not mindfulness getting people to, to behave themselves. And it certainly isn't discipline for kids to calm kids down and make them nice, quiet, compliant students. And very important in a teaching situation, because this does often come up, it isn't a simple, quick fix it solution. And this is, I think, the biggest problem with teachers. They want things to immediately work and to, to fix their problems. And it's slightly bedeviled, I think, by the image of mindfulness's toolkit. I mean, toolkits a useful image, and I know Kevin Hawkins used that for his book, and it's a smashing book, and it draws people in. But if they get stuck at the idea of this mechanistic idea of mindfulness, they'll be, they'll be um, disappointed, I think. We do need to remember that he's based on some very ancient deep wisdom, not just the Buddha, but dear old Aristotle, who said educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Um, the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh have both had interesting things to say. Thich Nhat Hanh talking about the mission is not just knowledge, but to form human beings, to construct a worthy, beautiful human race in order to take care of each other and our precious planet. And the Dalai Lama, who, of course, as we all know, those of us in mind and life, very interested in what he calls education of the heart and very keen to, to develop that work. And he's put a lot of effort and um, resources into sea learning, for example, 
So uh, I think we can see that um, that going right back to ancient wisdom, but also looking at modern contemplatives, education is at the heart of that spiritual and ethical quest. So that's our vision of what mindfulness is. It's, it's quite a deep vision, really. It certainly isn't just you know, a bit of breathing to calm kids down. So how does it work is our next section. And if so, how? And one of the things I do is to review evidence. And I've been reviewing evidence on this for about 20 years now. So chapter three outlines in some detail the outcomes of mindfulness for teachers, deliberately starting with teachers rather than students. Um, so that's we make it clear that this is where you begin. And just to you can read the document, so I don't need to outline it in detail. But the areas in which mindfulness does have outcomes are without any doubt mental health, stress, depression, anxiety, um, and so on. Um, but also the positives too. So making relationships with students, being fully present for one's students is a really vital skill for oneself and for other people. Um, so this is just as important as the well-being impact. And a whole other area which is important is helping teachers to do their job more effectively, um, to, be, to be better at juggling priorities, to see the wood for the trees, to stick to the task. Teachers report that they feel more effective as teachers, including in the tougher aspects of their job. So it's quite a rounded picture of what it does for teachers. It's not either or. Is it about stress or is it about being an effective teacher? It, these, these go together. And similarly, and I'm rushing through a lot of data here, you can imagine the outcomes for children and young people are also around stress, depression, anxiety, but also about well-being, feeling good about ourselves, about empathy and other social and emotional skills. Also about um, being the best you can be, really, about movement in body practice. It's about sport and it's not just about winning, but it's about it's about sport and creativity. It's about everything to do with cognition as well, looking at executive function and memory and, and so on, leading to some quite clear results on the academicals in schools. There's, there's clear impacts on learning and even on standardised test scores and on creativity, which is nice. So it, you can see very much that this links very much with the fundamentals of education. It's really not just about mental health and well-being. It has a whole range of impact on all the things that schools and, and other places are about. Now, there's a quite, I think, groundbreaking chapter, really, on how it works, where we brought together the mechanisms and the neuroscience, very much building on Jamie's agency document, Gabor, you know, building on that argument and saying, how does this apply to education? So we've looked both at the psychology and the neuroscience of how mindfulness impacts on some deep competencies. One of which, of course, as we know, is attention. You know, this finding it difficult to concentrate, I'm not sure why in the modern world, is, is very much um, what one of the things that mindfulness can address, helping us to hone our ability to pay attention. And the attention is what shapes our life. Um, I, I can't remember who said, you know, our, our attention is our life. It constitutes everything about our, about our life is what we pay attention to is who we are. So learning to pay attention uh, is, is so vital and so under attack in the modern world. But it also impacts on metacognition, the ability to, to think about thinking. Thoughts are not facts. The ability to stand back for one's thoughts and to be critical of, of one's, one's thought stream impacts on all the effective side too, compassion, empathy, and so on. Um, just going back one, and leading really to the entirety of self-regulation of mind, body, emotions, you know, it, mindfulness can bring all of this together, but not in a simple way. And the chapter maps out the, the links between the different areas of the brain and the body and these different capacities, but also concludes that it's complicated and you can't just you know, say the amygdala manages, you know, the hypervigilant system. It's, it's, you can get indications from neuroscience of what's happening in the brain and the body. But what we're, the more we learn about neuroscience, the more connected we realise the mind and body are. So that these things are, are quite complex. And I'm quite, quite proud of that chapter because I think it really does start to move mindfulness away from the simple randomised control data into something that's a bit more fundamental. Because the argument then becomes about seeing mindfulness practice and the attitudes it generates as foundational to education and transformative. So it's not just a bolt on extra that's nice for a bit of well-being. It actually becomes something that can be 
foundational to education. And that really is the essence of where we're going with this next, I think. So I'll whip through some of these a little quickly, but we have a chapter on establishing foundations. So if a school wants to get started, they might, for example, um, have mindfulness champions who spread the evidence for mindfulness. They might encourage their staff to meditate. They will get it on the timetable because it's things that aren't on the timetable don't exist in schools. They will, if they're sensible, collect evidence and um, evaluate what they're doing. They'll recognise it's going to take time, the tortoise and the hare, and they won't try and go too quickly. Um, but they'll also recognise, I should have said, that it also takes money and finances. So that, you know, this getting mindfulness going in an educational establishment is not a quick and easy fix. When we want to develop it for teachers, we have to start where they are. And a lot of them feel like that, really. They don't have all day for this. I went and taught mindfulness to teachers in my local secondary school, and they were certainly teaching teachers at four o'clock in the afternoon after a long day. It was a bit of an uphill struggle, really. I had to work hard to keep their attention and discovered you don't do body scan at four o'clock in the afternoon with your teachers because they all fall straight asleep. You have to do lots of lively things. So starting where teachers are with what helps them immediately in their day helping them recognize how important it is to look after themselves before they look after other people. The old image of apply your own oxygen mask first. And that's really difficult for teachers to do often. They're so other centered that that's a difficult one. But encouraging things like meditation groups at lunchtime and after school, as well as talk practices. Um, as I say, remembering it, it costs money to do this and linking with what I've already talked about, the fundamental tasks that face teachers helping them to actually realize that they that teaching is like being in a snowstorm and you, you can't get around that, but you can be better at, at managing the snowstorm or learn to surf might be another way to see it. <laughs> so linking it with their, with their day job. And when we want to teach it to students, we need to make sure that although we are teaching meditation, that we don't impose this on students, that we base it on relationships, that it's invitational, because teenagers are, some are starting to rebel against mindfulness in schools, in, in classes, and saying this is all very, if you just impose it on them without having a good relationship first, it can feel quite coercive. We need to make sure our work's trauma informed, it's not, mindfulness is not for all students by any means, and there's some who it's not indicated for, or we need to be very careful about how we teach it. And we need to find fun ways to engage in this with children and young people. People who just simply go on adult mindfulness courses and think that you can just do exactly the same with a class of teenagers are going to, going to crash and burn quite rapidly. <laughs> you know, there is a lot to know about how to make this sort of work fun and relevant to kids. <coughs> and we've got quite some good examples in there. And using peer learning because young people like learning from one another. And the word of inquiry is important. A lot of teachers will do a mindfulness practice with kids and then talk as if this should have fixed their inner difficulties, that they should now feel calmer or happy and so on. And are not good at simply being with what is and encouraging kids to explore what actually happened during a practice. And this is quite a skill. And I think that's the most difficult thing to teach school teachers. They're so used to finding answers all the time that helping young people to bring those attitudes of open mindedness to their experience is quite tricky for them. But very transformative if they can do that, it really does open up a whole new way of teaching for many teachers. <coughs> we, I'm not used to talking for this long, Gabor. <laughs> I have a quiet life mostly. So excuse me if I'm a bit froggy. We discovered many places where mindfulness is starting to embed within a whole school approach. So get out of its silo as a sort of eight week intervention and actually start to, to make some sense across, across the school. Starting with, as I say, the building staff capacity to do this work, often linking immediately with mental health and well-being. That's the most obvious place to start in schools. It's not the place you always finish, but you do need to make those links. Linking particularly with work on social and emotional skills. That's another obvious place for this. Um, and with children with special needs, with um, anxiety or mental health issues of other kinds or stress. So those are the, the most obvious places. But building out, out from that, actually getting students engaged with this work and using them to teach one another. <coughs> getting parents and the community engaged with this work. And this is perhaps the holy grail really, starting to link with the mainstream curriculum. 
And this, this is where it links very much with work that's happening in higher education in what we call contemplative pedagogy, actually getting teachers of all subjects to help young people to use mindfulness to understand themselves as learners more effectively. Building towards the, you know, the, the major shift, which is the whole climate and ethos of the school, starting to build schools, colleges, universities, where open mindedness and kindness and caring and being present and reflective and so on, start to actually be what the classroom or the, the, the lab or the school or the university is actually about. So it's a miles away from this is a bolt on extra. So that would be what a whole school approach or a whole university approach would be, very much a coherent te teamwork approach. And we've got quite a lot to build on in the UK. Um, <coughs> those of you who go on the Mind and Life Europe website will have seen a whole database of programmes across Europe, quite a lot of which are in, in the UK. And mindfulness in schools, Mind with Heart, Youth Mindfulness, all of these are excellent programmes, uh, Mind Up and so on. So we've got some really good, solid examples to build on in the UK, which enabled us in the book to build on some quite solid case studies, which teachers find quite convincing. You know, you can give them the theory as much as you like, but if you give them a real case study, they then become more convinced. So we've got lots of case studies and quotes from real life schools, primary, secondary, state, independent, special schools, all at various stages in this implementation journey from just starting to think about it to a few where mindfulness is becoming really fully integrated into the whole ethos of the school. So you might like to know where we think we're going next with this, having published our implementation guidance and it's going very well, people are using it uh, a great deal. Well, just to remind you what the Mindfulness Initiative is about, it's not just about kind of pushing mindfulness into, into schools, health and so on. It's very much about transformation. It's about what you might call contemplative practice and it's about social change. So that's really the vision for where we're going next. What we're wanting to do next, and we're applying for some funding uh, for a three year project to do this, to work with people who want to transform traditional models of education. And I guess just to cartoonize traditional education based on exams and standards and the conveyor belt sausage machine model, uh, the self, you know, look, just educating the individual separate from the world, separate from others, not a relational form of, of understanding at all, which often leads to a sense of alienation between the student and the, and the world of work and, and the world that is shifting around us. I mean, what young people are making of of life at the moment is, is, you know, is very difficult for them. The crises that are facing us, there is a real, a real um, lack of trust, I think, in the young, in what older people have to offer them by way of education. And saying, well, how is this making sense in a world of climate change and crisis and jobs? You know, will, will there be jobs? Will there be a world? So what it's bringing mindfulness into this debate because um, there are quite a lot of people who are, in the words of Winston Churchill, seeing the crisis as an opportunity. He once said, never let a good crisis go to waste, which is a cheering way to look at it. But people like the World Economic Forum and UNESCO and others have really quite radical visions of where education might go. <coughs> what most of them aren't doing is really getting how important the inner person is and the contemplative is to that. And many of them are seeing the answer is in technology. So I think it's trying to, to make sure that visions of where education might go include this sense of the, of the inner person and how important that is. Because I think we're very aware of what the crises are that face us, not just climate change, but war um, and uh, refugees, and particularly this terrible crisis of post-truth. You know, how, how do we help young people make sense of the world of the internet where anything goes? And where there's so much anger and polarization which seems to be increasing so how can mindfulness start to become part of the narrative for starting to really address the world that that we're looking at the mental health crisis is often cited um, you know young people fixated by the internet and by social media and of course teachers as well as i said earlier very much overwhelmed by mental health problems <laughs> so how can we what can we do what we what we're hoping to do is to try to get all of us to work together more. And it's a, it's a bit, you may say this is a bit over-optimistic, but we're hoping to try and build a coalition 
of the many people who want to place the cultivation of the inner person at the heart of education. And it's certainly much more than just what we might call mindfulness. I mean, it includes what we might call in Mind and Life Europe contemplative pedagogy and compassion. Uh, it includes what schools might call social and emotional learning, self-understanding, reflection. It includes embodiment in its many different forms. Um, so I think you can see if you look at that, that collection of, of areas, just what they have how they overlap but at the moment many of them are in silos and there's all kinds of fields and and forces trying to transform education but not working together very well so we have a we have a vision of attempting to at least start to bring together some of the key figures in these fields to to work together J jamie has a great idea of a, a manifesto for the inner person in education which is a nice idea it's a it's a major task but trying to bring bring some of these fields together and then between us to start to join the dots with the rest of education. If we had a clearer coalition of people who are interested in these, in the transformation of the inner person, we can then start to link more effectively with the obvious places where it's already working quite well, well-being and mental health, social and emotional learning, although that is sometimes a separate kind of silo, but other areas like um, educational leadership, staff development, the curriculum, um, and to move trying to move the, the whole ethos of schools this way, to start to look at the ethics and values that underlie education and thus the rest of society. Um, and of course, to bring together a whole range of research and evidence to, to support this. So if we could build a more of a coalition between um, those of us who are interested in transforming education and putting the inner person at the heart of it all, we might start to have more impact than if we all just, in a sense, arguing about the territory which is what I think is happening a lot at the moment so that's the, the vision for the next thing that we want to do and to realize the vision that I outlined at the beginning of putting the heart at, in the middle of education um, and so on sorry I've lost that uh, yeah you know the, these are wise words from our Zen masters and from our uh, Buddhist masters and from Aristotle, how are we going to actually start to make this happen? And I think the vision is by trying to work together more than we are at the moment. And what we're trying to demonstrate, just to finish on a humorous note, how we can all work together to help education cultivate what the Mind and Life Initiative, what um, the Mindfulness Initiative calls a new kind of human to face all the challenges, because as the dinosaur said, the picture's pretty beat, gentlemen, the world climates are changing and we've all got brains the size of a walnut. So it's to try to um, impact on our brains the size of a walnut and to, um, to help us to expand what our inner capacities so that we are more able to work together, to see the long term vision, to see what's in our real interests and actually work together to, uh, to make education at the heart of this effort. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. And um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now, but I'd love to have any comments and any questions that might have been building up on chat. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Of course, uh, if you haven't read the document yet, you can uh, find it uh, on the Mindfulness Initiative website. So please uh, take a look. You can download it free and uh, it's available and you can read. Um, I'm looking for some questions. Hi, Nimrod, good to see you. Um, looking for some questions from you, uh, and while waiting, uh, just please feel free to sh to raise your hand or indicate in the chat that you have a question or type the question in the chat. Uh, I would like to ask a question, uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, this uh, book uh, has been published for several months now. You indicated uh, it was published uh, in the springtime, and I wonder how this uh, this uh, document, this uh, really strong statement uh, has been received ever since by uh, teachers, policymakers, uh, partners of the Mindfulness Initiative, uh, or any other uh, potential stakeholders that uh, you wanted to address with this, with, this, uh, with this book? Yes. Well, it's certainly gone down well with the great and the good who've been kind enough to write nice things about it for us. <laughs> Uh, but you're right to ask them, you know, the more the more important question is how it's getting through to teachers uh, and schools. I, I think one way in which it's doing that is that the all the major mindfulness programs in the UK have actually adopted it as their textbook. 
which is helpful. So if you go on a mindfulness in schools project course, you will be given a copy or download a copy of that as the it's now become the theory book, really, which is, I think, very helpful for those who are working in schools. We've got in the UK a major shift that's happening in Wales. Um, Wales is ahead of the pack, really, in terms of, you know, you probably appreciate the UK is not one country, but four. And you know, the relationships between us all are not always comfortable. Um, but the, Wel the Welsh are ahead of the pack when it comes to education, which is done separately in Wales from England and Scotland, and have put well-being at the core of their curriculum. And within well-being at the core of their curriculum, they put mindfulness at the core of their well-being curriculum. So, and also within the heart of educational leadership. So uh, the implementation document, which was um, very much informed by what was happening in Wales. I mean, we worked hard to make sure we pulled in everybody in the UK we could and got their quotations and examples is being used right across Wales um, in that quite major educational initiative that's happening there. So that will be interesting. Um, I know it's gone, the, the United States have got quite excited about it. And um, the, the, the group of people out there who are working in social and emotional learning, Castle and others have, uh, have, have taken this on and found, found actually that the messages from it are very much the same as they would have in the United States, because of course it built on international evidence too. So it seems to be fairly international. But I'm sure we could do more. And one of the things that we're hoping to do when we get the funding is to take the document and cut it up and put it on the website in bite-sized pieces so that rather than somebody having to download this as a book and you know work through it you can actually go on the website and look up look up it you know the, the salient parts of it when when you need them so i think that will help so i think trying to get the key messages of it are are um work in progress but it is helping, for example, we've got an initiative in the UK on for mental health leads, uh, you know, leadership, because um, like everywhere, we have a mental health crisis and this mindfulness has become a part of that. And this book has become part of the of the curriculum for those who are coming to train to be leads in mental health and now looking at that book to say, well, what is mindfulness about? But it's not, it's quite a challenging document for many involved in mindfulness in schools because it does say, look, quite a lot of what you're doing is a bit thin. <laughs> you know, if you just teach this as relaxation, for example, you're missing out that opportunity for mindfulness to be about transforming your experience and your relationship with experience. And if you just teach it to kids, you're not really starting in the right place. So it's not, not always an easy document for people to read. I mean, they, some people sort of take a sharp breath before they, they have a look at it. So it's, it's always an issue. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we received one question from uh, Ruben Flores uh, before, yeah. before the meeting, actually. He sent a question to us in writing. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Ruben, here live? Or uh, would you like me to read it? <laughs> I, just if you want to read it, that's fine. No, please, please, please ask your question yourself. Well, no. So thanks, uh, Catherine. Very interesting talk. My question was about the extent to which mindfulness interventions uh, could benefit from working together with efforts like collective efforts to change, reduce social inequalities. Yes. I'm thinking here of all the you know, literature that has shown how more inequality translates into worse mental health, worse educational outcomes. Mm. And so sort of, you know, it, it, I suppose my question was whether you as a group are thinking also, you know, in those terms of addressing yes. wider inequalities. Yeah, well, it's a really important question, um, and I think it's a question for all of us, actually. How, how do we ensure that the work we do doesn't only appeal to a very small segment of society? You know, that it's not middle class, that it's not white, <laughs> that it's not very talky, for example, that it doesn't appeal more to girls who find it easier to sit, I'm being stereotypical here, than boys who like doing that it makes sense to, um, you know, to ethnic groups who may feel alienated and may find that this is coercive 
you know, there's a lot of work to do, I think, for us to examine ourselves as educators and to look at the ways in, I, th I think the core of what mindfulness is about is potentially highly transformative, Ruben. I think, you know, to, to, to be able to reflect on your own experience and what the world, the impact of the world on oneself, to think critically about your own thought patterns, to feel more compassionate. These foundational capacities that I talked about are potentially crucial for social change of all kinds, including in, um, in achieving greater diversity and less inequality and so on. But we've got to look at how we do it um, and just take care of the form. And I think that's really, it's a really good question because it's very much work in progress. Um, a colleague of, of mine who is a keen member of Mind and Life Europe, Michael Breedy, who runs a project called Youth Mindfulness, works very hard on, on this issue with his underprivileged kids up in, in Scotland. And he's very imaginative and responsive and to, to what they need. You know, he doesn't go in there with a fixed idea. He will, he himself is a mindfulness practitioner par excellence, and he's extremely switched on to what's gonna work. I mean, if I can give, give you a nice example, Ruben, because it's quite fun. He was telling me that uh, there was one girl in his class who was obviously quite traumatized by life. And we'd come in and say, I don't want to do this mindfulness crap. I'm not going to do it. And, and we'd sit there with her school bag on her in front of her, like a kind of protective shield. So he said, well, it's fine. You don't need to do it. Just sit over there. You know, fine. And she sat down on the comfortable chair. And after a while, he looked at her. He could see she was actually closing her eyes and following the practice, but she wasn't going to admit it kind of thing. So he was quite responsive to the to that. Meanwhile, some of the some of the lads who he'd got lying on the floor to do a body scan meditation all started acting up and say, well, it's not fair. <laughs> Why can't we sit up there? You know, you've made us lie on the floor. And he he used his intuition to think they're just they're just fooling around. So he said he said oh, basically shut up and get on with it. <laughs> and he went, you're all right. Um, so he was I think it came back to his own ability to be really present and to really tune in to the children and young people in his class and know which ones were behaving in what ways and what was a skillful way to encourage encourage young people to practice it in all kinds of different ways and it's not the kind of thing you can bottle very easily or write up you know it, it comes back to being a mindfulness educator yourself who's really tuned in to young people and in, in tune to their cultures and the way they think and the way they are and is able to teach to teach them. I mean, Michael himself is, came from a very poor background himself. You know, he's he, he is himself quite street streetwise. You know, he's got a lot of credibility with these young, difficult lads, and therefore he was really able to teach them at the same time as being quite soft and gentle with the girl with the trauma and the bag. Um, so it's it's a long answer to your question, but there's no simple way to do it. And for me, it comes back to making sure that you have good teachers. Who are not only good at mindfulness but also really tuned in to issues about learning difficulties and trauma and inequality and whose work on mindfulness is integrated into that so there's no sort of simple program you can use it's it comes back to real life people in a way it's a long answer to your question Ruben but you know it's it, it's a very human activity isn't it Te teaching anybody anything um, and helping people overcome their challenges is inevitably a very human and quite a subtle activity, really. I don't know what, do you, do you want to respond to that, Ruby? Thanks, Catherine. I, I'd love to respond a little bit, but I see there's other questions. Um, I, I don't want to take the floor. No, I, no problem, Ruben, we have time. We have time for the other questions as well. So please respond. So, so no, I, I really like this example of working with, you know, working class kids and, and I suppose they, you know, I, I was thinking of um, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett's The Health Gap uh, and the, the Inner Level, right? Like this kind of argument that we're, I suppose my concern is that, you know, I, I, I do believe that mindfulness can help, but at the same time, we need to be addressing the wider reasons that, you know, why people are feeling mm. on ease and are feeling like, suffering from mental health is kind of wider inequalities. Mm. Um, 
basically i'm just i just want to say that i i see some room for like integration and and working together like um, but yeah um yeah i mean lots lots to think about uh, for me at least and yeah. so thanks so much for thanks so much for that and i'll, I'll just um, keep thinking about these things I'd like I think if we could stay in touch ruben that would be useful because what you put your finger on is exactly what our issue is now you know how do we move mindfulness out of its silo and really start to connect with these important social issues. I'll send you an email. I'll send you an email. Yes, that, that would be lovely. Thank you. So you—that's exactly what we're trying to do. But great, great question. This is exactly what I appreciated in this uh, in this book, Catherine. That we used to focus on the inner dimension of mindfulness, and now you are highlighting its applicability and the necessity of its applicability in wider contexts. In the, in the whole school dimension, in, in societal dimensions. So basically at the societal and systemic level. And that's where the real big question and challenge and work to do uh, arrives and comes. Uh, how we can uh, implement some of the principles and practices of mindfulness in a wider social, uh, relational, societal, uh, systemic context. That, that's where the real challenge lies. And uh, I think Ruben's question was uh, addressing an, an, a, a certain aspect of that wider societal context. And I see some questions here in the chat from, uh, from Nimrod uh, first, and I see Mark and also Salah. So let's start with uh, Nimrod. Uh, you raised an interesting, not one, actually more interesting question. So you want, you want to share them? Uh, one after another. Can you unmute yourself, Nimrod, please? We can't hear you. Sorry for that. Hi. Um, I simply said that it's in the chat, and to save time, Catherine may, may just relate, and we save a few good minutes by, by me not repeating it. Okay. Uh, okay. But that means I've got to read it, because I've been busy... I think it's fine if you if you if you raise the question live because this is recorded Nimrod and all right uh, sorry okay. I'll, well. I'll do it quick first is very technical how can I have a permission to translate document into Hebrew and I can probably initiate other translations to colleagues elsewhere um, so that's uh, you don't have to answer now it's a technical question you can email me if you wish if you wish Yes. Second, I was in, I'm still interested uh, in the context of the variety of programs in the UK. Is there any unofficial breakdown uh, to the to the um, how much is there dot B versus uh, uh, mind up, uh, yes. etc. In in and and in the big field also in comparison to to the whole field, is yes. is, is it? Uh, half a percent versus two percent and and point zero zero percent okay of many programs and different comparison the yeah. last one is the is is most significant question that i'm still perplexed about we know most of us i guess guesstimate in the screen have been practicing quite a bit or are still practicing every once in a while or more than every once in a while and we take it for granted in a way uh, in MBSR, emphasis is you need to practice. Otherwise, don't come for the once a week. Practice every day and collect practice points daily. Otherwise, don't come. Uh, with teachers, at least in my personal uh, opinion and, and, and uh, experience, they are not as likely to practice. And we need to figure it out how to make them not how to make them practice, but how to make them experience something meaningful enough for them to carry the torch on, to flame on, to yes, children sure. or to themselves. Otherwise, again, what's the point? And with children, we, we definitely don't, we don't demand them to practice. And I still, obviously, you see, we see good results, but it would be nice to think and express something because of the false concept that, People may think that we force children to practice and who knows what will happen to them, etc. And we don't, and we still want good enough outcomes and we can get it. So that, that's the third, third question, question comment. 
I'll start with the last one, Nimrod. Good, it's the million dollar question, really. Um, fortunately, we can't force people to meditate because you've no idea what they're doing in there. So that's good. <laughs> um, it's I think this is where for me it becomes so important, as you know, Nimrod, to think about a whole school approach. If you have a whole school where there are just gentle nudges to practice, where you've got lunchtime groups that teachers can drop into or before school, where you have assemblies where people might do a little practice together at the beginning because the head teacher understands practice, where teachers might routinely engage a class in a practice at the beginning and the end. Um, where sometimes you have pauses with bells, you know, and people understand that, where you have staff meetings where the, you know, the senior management might encourage practice. I think it does come from really trying to start with the senior management so it starts to permeate down through the school, because it's difficult if your model is simply teaching individual teachers to practice that without that group around them, they will find that very hard to keep doing. So I think it's it's at its best where it starts to go in through the senior management and starts to impact on the ethos of the school, but without being coercive. You know, you keep the practices short, you don't insist anyone does anything like close their eyes, but you just invite them to sit quietly if it's not their thing. And it starts gradually, I think, to, to permeate. Um, but it, you know, we've got quite a lot of examples in our, in our guidance of, of where that is starting to happen. It's easier in smaller schools than big schools. It's easier in primary schools than secondary schools, but it is it is starting to happen. And I think that's quite quite cheering, really. But we when I taught it to to the teachers at my local secondary school, not all of them kept practicing, but a lot of them used it for a few minutes a day and at times of difficulty. And I think that's that's a a result that out of a class of 12, three of them kept religiously practicing every day, but everybody used it somehow. And I felt that was, I think you've said in your thing, good enough. It felt it had helped them. I also think that when people get some of the fundamental attitudes of mindfulness, that is in itself transformative. So the thoughts are not facts, is for some people a real walking through a door of wow. I hadn't ever really thought that I am not just my thoughts. And even if they don't practice meditation, once they've seen that, they have a more spacious relationship with their thought stream that, that is, remains helpful um, or, and, and so on. And people becoming more aware of the impact of stress on their body. They don't necessarily have to meditate to just become, to, to live those attitudes of mindfulness. So I think, I think we can have an impact without necessarily having everybody we teach practicing for 40 minutes every day. <laughs> I don't know if, if you'd agree with that, Nimrod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the second question of Nimrod was on the percentage of the UK-based yes. uh, programs. If you mean, uh, of how many programs do you mean? No, how they are, um, how they relate to uh, each other and to the wider field of education, I think, uh, in terms of yes. these are million, again, we don't we don't know Nimrod. We don't because um, our government's not taken all that much interest in anything anymore uh, around schools. They just say to schools, go and do it, you know, do whatever you want. We don't care really. There's, we've lost that central driver that we used to have. Um, nobody collects any central data. And we've not had the um, capacity in the Mindfulness Initiative, who are, by the way, not associated with any particular programme. We're very much independent. But it would be, I think that would be a good piece of work we'd like to do if we get our next piece of funding, just to get a much better map. When I asked the various Mindfulness in Schools programmes how many people they'd taught, I got incredibly vague answers. You know, they sort of had to sit there doing sums on the backs of envelopes. So no, no clear answer. But there's no doubt that the Mindfulness in School project is the largest in terms of the number of programmes and the number of students reached. But that doesn't mean uh, it's got the, the most evidence too, but it doesn't mean it's the only one or even, you know, I wouldn't like to judge it as the best one. I think we need a, a you know, quite a, quite a range. And I love having the fact we do have a range. But I can't answer that question that precisely, Nimrod. It's a shame I can't. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Um, Mark, maybe turn to you now. Yeah, first of all, Catherine, thanks a lot for this impressive presentation and very inspiring presentation. You, you really kind of gave a good foundation and practical hints, so to say, different directions. What stayed in one way was a coalition to really that, that you have this approach that together initiatives. 
Um, our charity is working with Mind with Heart, for example, and I know that they did a study in Australia, Nimrod, which may be interesting because it was the biggest study three years ago. And there were some findings may be relevant, Catherine, for, mm -hmm. for this. But my question actually is, we're talking about system change and with this, with the Corona situation, I'm working as an educator and we're working on system change and we have this, this approach of uh, this multi-stakeholder approach. My question is, could you imagine that actually to have parallel system of education instead of going the hard way in the strong hierarchical, school systems all over the world are strongly hierarchical mm. and they have their own then dynamics. At the same time in Germany, there's a movement with alternative schools, which kind of link complementary with the ordinary school system to mm. have a different set of teachers and there who are more facilitators. Mm. You don't have the full education as a teacher, but who facilitate the self-learning process. Could you imagine that mm. redefining the role of a teacher mm. going away from the content more into the relationship? Yes. Uh, to speed up the process of the system change, because if you try just to focus on the system and bring mindfulness in it, mm. maybe these different islands of different ways of opening up the education system could be an accelerator. Mm. And the example I gave was the Boots Org, the care system in Holland. They completely re re revolutionized within eight years the whole care system in Holland. Wow. By, by, because it was so reglamented, like in the education system, and they just kind of broke it up because the dissatisfaction mm. of people was so large and the burnout rate. And so they, they went back and we could like model and use that. And instead of teaching mindfulness, and it's, it's more like embodying mindfulness, what I yes. got from yes. and, yes. and doing And doing that with, with a new set of people who kind of come back from this intrinsic motivation of caring for youth. Could you, these are my questions more like, does that, Really helpful observations. I think it's a really interesting question how, let's call it mindfulness, or let's call it a bit more widely, the cultivation of the inner person. Because I think that's, you know, that takes in so many different forms of practice. Um, how making sure that what's in, in a way, whatever we're doing, we remember how important that is. Um, because it's not always obvious to people who do try innovations in education of, you know, of changing around how we organize it and so on. It's not always obvious to them how important that cultivation of the inner person is, you know, um, and I think making sure that that mindfulness and the contemplative are there at the heart of, in a sense, whatever we're trying to do. It may be that if we do uh, deliver things differently, that it becomes easier to to make the inner person a central feature of that and and that the two are, are in synergy. And I think that's important, but it doesn't always go together. Now, one of my fears at the moment is that people will see the future of education um, as in technology. You know, post COVID, you know, can't all kids just learn at home with their computers? You know, can't, can't we just go for distance learning? Why do we need teachers? You know, there's, there's a lot of threats, I think, of, of system change. As, as well as opportunities. And it's making sure that the human and the, the whole inner person, the whole person and the inner person are, are a part of that. But I think you're, you're right, Mark, that it may be that some changes to how we deliver education are more advantageous to putting that whole person and the contemplative at the heart than, than others. And I'd love to think that, again, think that through more with you, you know, whether, and whether that's what, that's what people remember to do so yes. it's not, really, not a very good answer but i think i think that then they, no, they don't necessarily go together and part of what we're trying to do in the mindfulness initiative is to try and make sure that they do just saying uh, i said that last gabo knows about that I, I mentioned that in one of the last sessions there is this initiative in germany which is just going from this approach of considering new science scientific findings and it's like um redefining school at a whole and they have a whole network in Germany and this longing is quite big and I can imagine your approach 
about this coalition. Yes. To have actually even a, a European coalition of actually putting that back and mm. it may be inspiring for you to, to get a connection to the German network. It would be very nice. Um, yes, and it may be um, one of the things I hope, Gabor, is that that the Mindfulness Initiative and Mind and Life Europe cooperate more. So it could well be something that links up the visions of the two different organisations where it becomes, yes. you know, because what the CCE has been trying to do is, is very similar, really. I mean, you know, the to what we, we're doing with the implementing mindfulness, you know, there's it's the vision of the CCE is, is synonymous, I think, really, with the vision of the implementation guidance. So it could be an interesting one for Europe to push forward into. De definitely, Catherine and Mark. I think uh, the the next step for CC and for the development of education in this context that we are talking about now <laughs> is not only to map the concrete activities and initiatives done in different parts of Europe, but also to come together to design um, uh, a more complex theory of change, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the one you are referring to, Mark, uh, in Germany, that there, there's a new approach to create uh, or and refine and re redesign schools at a, at a larger scale. And that's where uh, these types of initiatives would require a real coalition building mm. and a real uh, impact uh, coming from various already established organizations like Mindfulness Initiative or Mind and Life Europe and others. So I fully agree with this proposal and this approach. So Catherine, I think that would be the next natural step for us mm. to consider in the context of CC and also in the context of partnership with Mindfulness mm. Initiative and, us and others. Uh, so Mark, uh, thank you for the... Yeah. For the point and for the suggestion. Thank you for the time. Yeah, let's let's you. continue this uh, more concrete uh, discussion on, on yeah. how, to, how to build networks. Very exciting, Mark. Thank you. Um, now I would turn to to, to Salamarit. If you if you if you are ready, <laughs> you yes. also have a question. Hello, Salah. Nice to see you. Hello. Nice to see you too, Catherine. And uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation and, and, and for the most interesting discussion. I'm so grateful to be able to, to listen to this all. Uh, my uh, question was about the uh, trauma-informed mm. um, concept, and, and, and I would like you to open up that, that a little. What teachers who, who teach mindfulness to, 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 to kids in classroom, what, what should they take into consideration when we talk about a trauma-informed yes, informed teaching? And then what we who teach teachers to do that work should take into consideration. Absolutely. Well, it's, I think it's becoming a growing area of interest within mindfulness. How do we become more trauma-informed about, about this at every level? And uh, clearly, particularly in schools, when you have what Richard Burnett calls um, conscripts, you know, if you have a class of kids, they don't have an option if you tell them to do something. Um, you know, the, you've got a real responsibility, I think, when you teach this to people who haven't opted to come on a mindfulness course like adults do. So I think we have to be especially careful for a start. And we've got a real duty of care, I think. Um, I think a starting point is, and I'm relying on Michael Breedy here, who has done a lot of work on this in his youth mindfulness work, is to start by saying how vital it is you have a relationship with the, with the young people. That people who just come in and teach a class without knowing the background, knowing the, the history of the children, knowing what they're going through, that's where a lot of the dangers come about, where somebody doesn't know the young people. So the starting point is to build it on a relationship. It's, um, and to know quite clearly that there may be children or young people or students for whom particular forms of mindfulness practice are just not indicated right now. Somebody who's in the middle of a severe depression, for example, um, you, you know, one would have to take care with. Somebody who had been the victim of abuse, you would be very careful doing a body scan yeah. meditation. And you may well just say, not, not for you, you know, just, you know, just quietly um, encourage them to sit it out or, you know, and to know, in other words, to, to link up what you know about them and what you know about the practices to always make it invitational, um, to absolutely emphasize, look, nobody has to do anything. I'd like you to sit quietly and not disturb the others, <laughs> but you know, and, and you don't have to shut your eyes. And if you don't find this practice helpful, um, and if you start to get worried or agitated, just 
leave it, you know, because for some children, for example, following the breath can be quite agitating um, if they've got, um, if they have breathing difficulties, for example. Um, so you, you, you've got to always emphasize without over, without making people neurotic, but just emphasize safe anchors. And ideally, I think, try to always teach with someone else, another adult in the classroom who can be keeping an eye on, on the young people and just seeing whether anybody's suggesting signs of distress and to encourage them to to uh, share it in the to share if they want to after the practice but again not insist on it because you can sometimes give vulnerable children a false sense of security by encouraging everyone to share and Richard Burnett talks a lot about not not opening up the soft underbelly <laughs> because kids can be quite cruel so just inviting people to share if they want to but I mean, having said all that, we know that mindfulness can be very helpful for kids with mental health difficulties and challenges and traumas. So it, you don't want to not do it, but you just have to be more careful. Yeah. Um, the um, Will Willoughby Britain's written some really good stuff on this, Salah, um, who, you know, so getting her materials into teacher training, I think, is, I just think it's important with our mindfulness teacher training that we start to incorporate these kinds of, yeah. these kinds of discussions, but we don't want to not do it, but, yeah. Because my colleague Adrian Bethune points out that getting changed for PE can be pretty traumatising for some children. <laughs> you know, we don't not do PE, but we are aware that for some kids that this can be can be difficult. So we take, you know, duty of care. We take due care of, of, of these sensitive moments. I don't know what, what you think of that answer, Salah. Does that make some sense? Yes, yes, that's, that was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for the, the tip to, to read more. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Bruce, I saw your question in the chat too. It's really interesting. Uh, would you like to address it yourself? Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Catherine, thank you very much indeed for all your work uh, in, the, in this area. Um, I think both uh, in education and in uh, mindfulness, uh, we, we, we've been drowning in information and, and starved of wisdom. And I think your work is adding wisdom uh, which is very much needed um, I think it was T.S. Eliot uh, said that you know we had uh, was it where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge uh, where is the knowledge we've lost in information so thank you uh, for every, everything that you're taking in that direction um, I've raised this before and you've accused me of being awkward <laughs> 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 Which is fair enough. Um, it's very easy when educationalists start discussing education, they get involved in the nitty gritty of how best to in introduce it and focus on the children. Um, but as we started to discuss earlier, there is a wider context, there is a society out there. And if we do uh, help our children to gain different views of themselves and a different worldview, uh, we also have to be prepared to uh, influence and inform society to accept children growing up who are going to uh, want to express themselves in a different way to the hierarchical system that we've had in the past. And um, I remember when you first um, I think uh, when you were first doing your research and you came to speak to Mind and Life Europe Summer uh, Research Institute, uh, you, uh, one of the comments that struck me that day was that you said you went into the schools expecting to find mindfulness uh, would be of benefit and you came out uh, w with the conclusion that compassion was the most important. And I think there's been a lot of change uh, around the world uh, to at least raise compassion uh, to the uh, uh, equal importance of wisdom. So um, if I could summarize perhaps uh, that the self-regulation of attention and awareness, uh, the mindfulness, if you like, the attitude of acceptance and self-acceptance as compassion uh, with intention essentially comprise the active processes underlying contemporary mindfulness and mindfulness training effects and attention has been well uh, researched 
Um, but there is a conflict between developing self-acceptance and uh, basically uh, societal social uh, media influences, uh, which if you consider them are based on dissatisfaction. You, you, you can't sell uh, over the internet or television if you don't make people dissatisfied with what they've got. So should we be extending, uh, maybe outside the educational group, maybe with Mind and Life Europe, uh, to encourage social media um, to resume what was a historical role of education, particularly in the areas of acceptance and respect, uh, rather than uh, the areas of dissatisfaction uh, that are prominent and prevalent. Well, yes, I think trying to get a grip on what the social media giants are up to is something that's perplexing everybody. <laughs> in, in so many, I mean, they're clearly pretty rogue and out of control and needing to be brought back into line because the Im impact of all their algorithms is is horrific. I was reading the other, you know, apart from just an educational role, it's a regulatory role, I think. I was reading the other day that the algorithms on Facebook have been set to prioritise dislikes eight times more than likes. Yeah, yeah. Because, because, you know, because they wanted to create controversy and therefore they're creating hatred and therefore they're creating, more, you know, so, so they're dialed to create all the toxic things, you know, they're dialed to create Dukkha, basically. And we really, you know, need to get hold of them at a, at a regulatory level. I think governments need to get hold of that, after which we may have some hope of getting them to be less toxic. Um, it would be good if we if they could do that and if they would stop just trying to sell sell things through the medium of whipping up controversy and clicks and all these other things. But I, I don't think there are, I think it important to regulate them. I think it's possibly equally important to try to help our young people to be critical of them. And yeah. I think schools can do massively more than they do in their media education. And yeah. it's a subtle business because if you go on too much, it sounds like you're a killjoy, but trying to help young people themselves to read, to read the media and to understand what's happening to them on social media. And I think we need to really, we need some Greta Thunbergs of, the, um, of social media really to stand up to all this and say enough is enough. We're not going to have our lives wrecked by this sort of toxic nonsense. So I think it's, I don't want to blame the young people for you know, having their lives wrecked, but I think it's I think it's two two things. So I think get hold of them in a regulatory way for a start and say stop doing all this stuff, um, and then there might be some hope that they start to feel they've got a better function. But at the moment they they're creating hate and misery, as you say, and they don't. And it would appear that they don't they they know this and they don't care. And I think it's quite terrifying what social media the social media giants have been doing. Yeah, well, all right, perhaps I was being a little kind to them when I said the influences of dissatisfaction, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, as an in interesting, if you could say almost objective study uh, of the this effect of this conflict on young people, um, I was uh, invited to Bhutan in, I think it was 2016, uh, to talk with them about uh, why they were having trouble with their uh, program of gross national happiness with their teenagers. And uh, obviously it has been working for generations and uh, uh, acceptance, both uh, self-acceptance and acceptance by society of the individual have been built into the system, uh, really from the age of seven uh, when they started mindfulness meditation type practices uh, and what had happened was that in 1999 uh, television had been introduced into Bhutan and in 2000 uh, the internet was introduced and as a consequence by 2016 they had a group of teenagers 16 17 who had actually grown up trying to marry the conflict between uh, their traditional um, psychological sense of acceptance and the um, Western influences of uh, dissatisfaction. And the question was, how do you help those people, those teenagers, uh, to, to come to terms with uh, completely different 
conflicting influences. And of course, the answer has to be through society educating them. It's not just in the education system, but it's got to be the uh, influence of society as a whole. So yes, this has to be built into what everybody is doing, not just the educational program, but also anything that Mind and Life Europe or other outside societies can do. Um, I think Greta pretty much recognizes it, although she's, um, she's focused on one particular area. Um, but I think that could be that sort of um, awareness is going to lead to uh, potentially a generation who um, will have a different worldview. And if they're allowed to express it, maybe they're the ones that will save the planet. Well, yes, I hope so. And, and their own mental health along with it. I think they need to get quite angry about some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah we were talking about that last time uh, during the talk with Kevin. And yes. uh, we, are yeah. we are going to continue talking about these. Yeah. Topic. Uh, I think we are designing some programs activities for next year already around uh, the mental health crisis and uh, social media and the younger generations challenges <laughs> with this topic. So it will be very much addressed and uh, hopefully not only discussed, but, uh, but uh, why the movement could also be created around this specific topic in the form of a coalition that we were discussing in the field of education. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, my basic premise, as you know, is that uh, at the moment, mental health problems are, are treated from a medical point of view. Yes. And I think that if we want to get some grip on it, we've got to actually move to education yes. and education, the, uh, the preteens. And this is what I've been discussing with the Irish government. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce and Catherine, for this uh, dialogue as well. Yeah. Um, um, before everyone would leave, I would just like to thank you, Catherine, for the presentation and for the really intrig intriguing and interesting uh, responses to the questions that were uh, quite uh, spot on. So it was a really meaningful and uh, forward-looking discussion, a lot to, to implement from this very little meeting, actually, yeah. for activities next year. And, um, I would also like to invite you to our next talk in two weeks on November 16th. That's going to be a Tuesday, not a Thursday uh, that week, where uh, Salah Marit uh, Bolanen, she's here with us, will talk, and her PhD, uh, PhD student, uh, Vila Huskaf, uh, will also be present and talk. Salah will talk about uh, implementation of mindfulness and CEL uh, skills into public schools in Finland. So we will hear about uh, concrete uh, examples and best practices uh, in Finland. And uh, her PhD student, Vila, will talk about a really interesting topic. I'm so much looking forward to that, learning from the religious and ethical critiques of mindfulness in public schools. That's gonna be really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think the title has multiple implications. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Villa what, uh, how he understands this challenge and the, the critique of mindfulness from these perspectives. So it's gonna be an, another interesting topic. We are looking forward to welcoming you all back and maybe others as well. So see you on November 16. And once again, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for your great work. Please keep doing that and we will be of help and support as well. Thank you very much everyone for, your, for listening and for your fascinating questions so thank you and seeing you Salah next year in two weeks time looking forward, forward to it as well <laughs> thank you